Hi, everybody. Welcome to Cafe Scientifique Silicon Valley at SRI International. I'm Marty Ritchie from SRI's corporate communications team, and I thank you for coming tonight. Um, as I mentioned at our last gathering, after hosting cafe events for seven years here at SRI, uh, the program will wind down here later this year. Um, but our next event is on July 14th, when Dr. Olenka Hubiki of San Jose State will talk about planet formation. So I hope you can come then on July 14th. Um, as a reminder, you can watch past cafe events on our YouTube channel. Uh, the URL is on bookmarks that you can pick up on your way out tonight. So on to tonight's event. Tonight we are pleased to welcome Dr. Ken Caldera and Dr. Armand Nukermans to the cafe podium. Dr. Caldera is a senior climate scientist at the Carnegie Institution for Science. He will present the topic of solar engineer, geoengineering and discuss what it might mean for society. Dr. Nukermans has held research and management positions at companies such as Xerox and General Electric. He was named Silicon Valley's Inter Inventor of the Year in 2001. Since his retirement, he has been fostering the causes of social entrepreneurs. Tonight, he will describe an effort to develop a spray system that could enable a study of marine cloud brightening for climate intervention. Our presenters will take your questions at the end of both presentations. Please use the microphones that will be set up in the back of the room to ask your questions so we can get them on the uh, videotape. So let's get started without further ado. Dr. Caldera, please come up to the podium. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Uh, this is a fairly interesting and controversial area, and uh, we look forward to the discussion. So, there's this, tonight's talk will be in two parts. Uh, I'll, I'll give some general framework to the idea of reflecting sunlight to cool Earth's climate, and then focus on one category of ideas, which is basically to emulate what large volcanoes do, and then Armand will talk about the second major idea, which is the idea of brightening clouds. So just um, to set a little, little context, uh, I don't think anybody is proposing the idea of reflecting sunlight or uh, to uh, substitute for emissions reduction. People who are concerned about the climate change problem realize that there's a whole chain uh, of activities uh, that lead to greenhouse gas emissions and that there are uh, a, a range of intervention points. And I, I won't go through this whole circle, but the idea is that you know, we can engage in conservation activities to try to improve our well-being in ways that don't involve increased consumption of goods and services, or we can try to improve efficiency of devices and systems so that we can provide goods and services without consuming so much energy and material goods. We can develop low carbon energy systems that can try to provide that energy without emitting CO2 to the atmosphere. There are a number of things we can do to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere after it's, it's been emitted, such as planting trees or there are also industrial ideas. Uh, today we're going to focus on this uh, branch here of trying to break the link between increased concentrations of CO2 in the atmosphere and the amount of climate change. And just to complete the circle, the idea is that uh, adaptation is an attempt to reduce the amount of uh, negative impacts on humans and ecosystems from the climate change that does occur. And so be just because I'm focusing on this point tonight uh, doesn't mean that the rest of these aren't important and probably more important, or not only probably, but and certainly the, the main task, I think, is really developing a low carbon energy system. So uh, the, the background for this is that uh, this is a record, there are several different records of global mean temperature over the last 135 years. And, and just to point out that while there has been uh, some relative stability in temperatures over the last decade or so, that temperatures have been increasing and, and a large number of studies show that this is primarily due to the anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases. And just to give one example of why, uh, of evidence that it is greenhouse gases and not natural variability, is that this stratosphere, the higher, highest, uh, one of the, you know, the upper part of the atmosphere, is 
cooling at the same time as the lower atmosphere is warming. And if it was something like changes in solar variability or changes in heat coming out of the ocean, you'd expect those things to heat or cool the whole atmosphere uh, at, at a time. And so this pattern of the stratosphere cooling while the lower atmosphere warming is a clear indicator that it's greenhouse gases that are primarily driving this. The other thing, uh, this is uh, from the previous uh, IPCC report, but th this is the projection uh, of a number of emission scenarios that were considered by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And the thing to note is that, uh, you know, so the upper bound of this envelope you might consider business as usual, and the lower bound of this might be what we might be able to achieve with a big effort at transforming our energy system. But in essentially none of these scenarios does, do temperatures actually start decreasing this century. And so, you know, one of, um, so, you know, one central point is that emissions reduction can reduce the amount of warming and it can reduce the rate of warming, but emissions reduction alone cannot actually cause the Earth's climate system to start cooling within this century. One way of thinking about it is that each, greenhouse gas emission, each emission of carbon dioxide produces another increment of warming in the climate system. And so if you stop emitting carbon dioxide, you stop producing additional warming, but that doesn't take away the warming that's already in the pipeline. And one of the things that primary uh, figures that has me concerned about climate change, and first of all, let me just say that I'm not a catastrophist with climate change. I think the most likely thing is that we'll just muddle through and, and that it's not going to be the end of civilization. It will be a cost. It will be, uh, you know, I st also study coral reefs and, and I think it will be devastating for coral reefs. But I think for people in developed countries that have reasonably high GDP, I think we'll be able to deal with it. But there's a chance that, that it will end up being much worse than, than we think it is. And this is a figure showing how many, um, under a business as usual scenario, how many uh, uh, summers are hotter than the hottest summer yet on record. And so this is saying, so, and if you see these red uh, areas, are areas where 90% of the summers will be hotter than the hottest summer yet on record. And it's through most of the tropics, much of China, much of uh, Africa, and, and parts of the United States. And, and so uh, in many places, record heat events have been associated with crop failures. And so there's at least some possibility that there'll be widespread crop failures later this century. Now, I'm not saying that this is the expectation or the most likely thing, that, that there's potential to develop better crops and so on. But I think we have to entertain that there's at least some possibility that there could be widespread crop failures throughout much of the tropics later this century. And so, and if we recall back from this figure, if we're somewhere here and you start getting widespread crop failures, the prospect uh, would be for the conditions to keep getting warmer and warmer. That uh, energy system transitions take a half century or longer. And, and as I said, even if you're successful with your energy system transition and re bring emissions down to zero, you only prevent further warming. And so really the only thing that anybody can do to prevent uh, the earth, uh, you know, to cause the earth to start cooling uh, on politically relevant time scales is to reflect sunlight to space. And it, it, it seems that doing this would be uh, extremely practical. And even if you think it's a bad idea, if there are, if, if people ever come to think that there's a, you know, start seeing climate change as catastrophic, there could be intense pressure for politicians to do something. And really these sunlight reflecting strategies are the only things politicians can do to cause the earth to start cooling within their terms in office. And so the political pressure, <laughs> no, you laugh, but the political pressure could become extreme. And so it's important that we understand the consequences of doing these things uh, now. Okay, so, oh yeah, this is a figure that's from a paper we did that I won't go through the whole thing, but let me just go through the red curve. This top, top row here, I'll switch to this side. The top, row shows atmospheric CO2 concentrations. 
uh, and the red line is what happens to atmospheric CO2 if you zero out instantaneously green, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And basically, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere starts declining as the oceans and land biosphere increasing, uh, take up increasing amounts of CO2. But the lower panel shows temperatures. And basically, even if you stop emissions completely, the Earth still warms a little bit more and then stays warm for many centuries. And so even zeroing emissions doesn't cause the planet to cool. It just prevents further warming and not all of the further warming. And so again, you know, so, so what could be done? There, there's been a number of about, say, three volcanoes over the last half century or so that caused the Earth to cool. And the one that did it most dramatically was Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991. And in 1990, uh, you know, so this is a, a reconstruction. There have been other reconstructions since then that modulate this. Uh, you know, some people think it might be slightly less than this, but, but the basic character uh, is correct that, you know, something like uh, a half a degree Celsius, maybe slightly less than a degree Fahrenheit, uh, of cooling occurred uh, the year after Mount Pinatubo erupted. And it's thought that if the amount of material that Mount Pinatubo put into the stratosphere remained in the stratosphere, it would have cooled the Earth enough to offset all of the warming expected this century. And, and, um, and it turns out that the amount of material is relatively, is not that huge. The, I was just on a National Academy panel that produced a report on this topic, and the conclusion was that um, the number of flights that you would need each year to maintain uh, an aerosol layer in the stratosphere that would reflect sunlight to offset the warming influence of carbon dioxide uh, uh, for all the warming expected this century would be a number of flights each year equivalent to about six hours worth of commercial aviation. So we're talking about something that's maybe three orders of magnitude smaller than the today's commercial aviation industry. So uh, there are a number of proposals for reflecting additional sunlight to space. One idea is to put satellites in space. This is this A. And just you can do back of envelope calculations. You would need to build satellite area you know, on the order of a square kilometer every half hour or something like this. It's just, it's just not practical. The, the, there are really two methods that have attracted, that seem most feasible, and the, the National Academy report concluded were most feasible. And one idea is to put uh, aerosols in the stratosphere. And, and basically, the amount of material needed would, would be, you would more or less need one fire hose worth of material going continuously, and that scale of effort would maintain a layer about of the same magnitude that Mount Pinatubo volcano produced. The other idea is to brighten or uh, marine clouds, and this is what Armand's going to talk about. There have been other proposals. In 1965, there was a report to President Johnson, which first was the first report that informed the president about uh, that carbon dioxide would or could induce global warming. And that uh, panel suggested that perhaps white objects could be floated on the ocean surface to reflect sunlight to space. What's interesting is that that report, which is a 1965 PSAC report, uh, didn't even introduce the idea that we might want to reduce emissions. So really, historically, this idea of reflecting sunlight to offset greenhouse gas emissions has deeper historical roots than uh, su the suggestion of emission reduction. People have also suggested whitening crops. Uh, the uh, Secretary of Energy, former Secretary of Energy Chu was advocating this idea of, well, we could whiten roofs and that would reflect sunlight to the space. It turns out that, well, these ones might not be feasible and have ecological problems. There's really, there's, no, there's not enough change in, in reflectivity that's achievable for, out of crops and there's just not enough roof space and road space to make a difference. And so really the, the two um, proposals that people have focused on is this idea of a stratospheric aerosol layer or brightening of marine clouds. Uh, I won't go into this. The, the, the cost uh, has been estimated um, uh, you know, for the brightening of marine clouds in the order of several billion dollars a year for the more effective methods. Uh, but I would like to point out that the Bay Bridge was originally 
projected to cost $1.3 billion, and I think it ended up costing six something billion dollars. And so, and that's after 10, 000, tens of thousands of bridges have been built. And so, you know, anytime you're trying to cost something that hasn't been done before. But the main point is that, um, you know, it's, it's measured in the billions of dollars, and maybe, it, maybe that could amplify to a few tens of billions of dollars, but compared to the global economy, which is somewhere between 50 and 100 trillion dollars per year, it, it, it's, it's basically in the noise. So just to show, this is a typical kind of figure of a doubling of atmospheric CO2 and the temperature changes produced. And then if you reflect uh, some of the sunlight, and if you do that uniformly, you overcool the tropics a little bit and undercool the poles, but you offset uh, on the root mean square basis. You, know, you offset about 90% of the temperature change on a local, uh, local basis. That if you look at the precipitation change is projected for a doubling of atmospheric CO2, and then say, well, how does that change for, um, uh, with reflecting some sunlight? It, it reduces the amount of change by around 70%. And so it's more effective at, at offsetting effects of um, temperature than, than hy hydrology. And um, this, this one is uh, the top panels. Let's, the thick lines are over land, and the red is just the doubling of CO2, and the blue is doubling of CO2 and reflecting some sunlight. And so it's not perfect, but it greatly reduces the amount of temperature change. On the, panel, the bottom panel uh, is showing change in precipitation. So again, it's, uh, it doesn't do a perfect job, but, but it greatly reduces the amount of change. And uh, obviously, this is for a full-blown deployment. Uh, you know, people, you could... Somebody could deploy it at half this level or, or at some lesser level. So, yeah, so the basic point is just as with volcanoes, that, uh, that the indication is that the, these approaches could cool the Earth quite rapidly. This is, again, some climate model simulations kind of turning on the system full tilt at year 2025, 2050, or 2075. And, you know, so basically, you could think of Mount Pinatubo. Yeah, so the Mount aerosols from Mount Pinatubo only stayed in the in the stratosphere for a year or two, so they would need to be continuously replenished. And so you could think of Mount Pinatubo as coming down this curve a half a degree, and then it stops and pops back up. And and so you would need to keep replenishing the aerosols as they fell out of the stratosphere. And so for a full blown deployment, and sort of offsetting all of the warming that's expected this century, the amount of aerosols would be a few percent of what's currently coming out of power plants. The, 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 the aerosols that are injected into the lower atmosphere, like from coming out of, say, Chinese power plants, stay in the, in the atmosphere maybe five days or so before rain takes those aerosols out. In contrast, aerosols in the stratosphere can stay in the stratosphere for a year or two because there's no rain there to, to rain, rain them out. And then they're, they're, these particles are small enough uh, um, that they don't fall out until they aggregate and become larger particles, which takes some time. <laughs>